Mescal, said the consul. The main barroom of the Fadalito was deserted. From a mirror behind the bar that also reflected the door opened to the square, his face silently glared at him with stern, familiar foreboding. Yet the place was not silent. It was filled by that ticking, the ticking of his watch, his heart, his conscience, a clock somewhere. There was a remote sound, too, from far below of rushing water, subterranean collapse, and moreover, he could still hear them. The bitter, wounding accusations that he had flung in his own misery, the voices as an argument, his own louder than the rest, mingling now with those other voices that seemed to be waiting from a distance distressfully. Borracho, borracho, borracho. But of these voices, one of these voices was like a bond's pleading. He still felt their look, their look in the Solana Folio behind him. Deliberately, he shut out all thoughts in the lawn. He drank two swift mezcals. The voice ceased. Sucking a lemon, he took stock of his surroundings. The mezcal, while it assuaged, slowed his mind. Each object demanded some moments to impede upon him. In one corner of the room sat a white rabbit eating an ear of Indian corn. It nibbled at the purple and black stops with an air of detachment as though playing a musical instrument behind the bar hung by clamped swivel a beautiful Wakenian Wa gourd of mezcla de olla from which he drank his drink had been measured ranged on either side stood bottles of denipana perateaga tequila anejo anis doble de mejilocra a violent decanter of Henry Mallet's delicioso licor, a flask of peppermint cordial, a tall bulleted bottle of anise del mono, on the label of which a devilish, a devil brandished a pitchfork. On the wide counter before him were saucers of two thick chiles, lemons, a tumbler of straws, crossed long spoons in a glass tankard, at one end large bulbous jars of many colored aguardiente. were set raw alcohol with different flavors in which citrus fr fruits rinds floated an advertisement tacked by the mirror for last night's ball in Guanajuato caught his eye Hotel Bella Vista Gran Baile a Beneficio de Cruz Roja Los Mejores Artistas de Radio en Acción No Falta Vede a scorpion clung to the adver adver advertisement the consul noted all these things carefully Drawing long sighs of icy relief, he even counted the toothpicks. He was safe here. This was the place he loved. Sanctuary. The paradise of his despair. The barman, the son of the elephant, known as a few fleas, a smart, small, dark, sickly-looking child, was glancing nearsightedly through horned rim spectacles at a cartoon serial, El Hilo de Diablo, in a boy's magazine, Tito. As he read, muttering to himself, he ate chocolates. Returning another replenished glass of mezcal to the console, he slept some on the bar he went on himself with chocolate skulls bought for the day of the dead chocolate skeletons chocolate yes funeral wagons the consul pointed out the scorpion on the wall and the boy brushed it off with a vexed gesture with a vexed gesture it was dead a few fleas turned back to his story muttering aloud thickly de pronto dale vuelve en ese grit, grita llamando la atención de un guarda guardia que pasa suertemente suertemente Save me, thought the consul vaguely, as the boy suddenly, wanting to be saved, had stung itself to death. No, as the boy went out for change, so it demanded help, maybe the scorpion, not wanting to be saved, had stung itself to death. He strolled across the room. After fruitlessly trying to make friends with the white rabbit, he approached the open window on his right. It was almost a sheer drop to the bottom of the ravine. What a dark... Melancholy place. In Parian de Cuplacan, and the crag there was still too, just as in Shelley or Calderon or both. The crag that couldn't make up its mind to crumble absolutely. It clung so, left to life. The sheer height was terrifying, he thought, leaning outwards, looking sideways at the split rock and attempting to recall the passage in the Sensei that described huge stack clinging to the mass of the earth, as if resting on life, not afraid to fall, but darkening, just the same. Where would, where it would go if it went, it was a tremendous, an awful way down to the bottom. But it struck him he was not afraid to fall either. He traced mentally the Barrancas circuitous abysmal path through the garden.
through the country through chattered minds to his own garden, then saw himself standing again this morning with Yvonne outside the printer shop, gazing at the picture of that other rock, La Despertida, the, great, the glacial rock crumbling, crumbling among wedding invitations in the shop window, the spinning flywheel behind. How long ago, how strange, how sad, remote as the memory of a first love, even of his mother's death, death it seemed, like some poor sorrow, this time without effort. Yvonne left his mind again. Bobo towered through the window, its immense flanks partly hidden by the rolling thunderclouds. Its peak blocking the sky, it almost, it appeared almost right overhead, the barranca, the Faralito directly beneath it. Under the volcano, it was not for nothing the ancients had placed Tartarus under Mount Etna, nor within it. The monstrous, the monster Tyophus, with its hundred heads and relatively fearful eyes and voices. Turning, the consul turned his, took his drink to the open door. A mercure chrome agony down the west. He stared out the Barian. There, beyond a grass plot, was the inevitable square with its little public garden. To the left, at the edge of the barranca, a soldier slept under a tree. Half facing him to the right, on the incline, stood what at first seemed to be a ruined monastery or waterworks. This is the gray turreted barracks of the military police he had mentioned to Hugh as the reputed Union Militar headquarters. The building, which also included the prison, glowered at him with one eye over an archway set in the forehead of its low facade, a clock pointing to six. On either side of the archway, the barred windows in the Comisario de Policia and the Policia de Seguridad looked down at a group of soldiers talking, their bugles slung over their shoulders with great green lariats. Other soldiers, putties flapping, stumbling, at sentry duty. <sighs> Under the archway, in the entrance to the courtyard, a corporal was a corporal was working at a table on which stood an unlighted oil lamp. He was inscribing something in the copper plate handwriting, the consul knew, for his rather unsteady course hither, not so unsteady, however, as in the square at Quanahuac earlier, but still disgraceful, had brought him almost on top of him. Though the through the archway, grouped round the courtyard but no courtyard and beyond, the consul could make out the dungeons with wooden bars like pig, pig pens. In one of them, a man was gesticulating. Elsewhere to the left were scattered huts of dark thatch, merging into the jungle which on all sides surrounded the town, glowing now in the unnatural livid light of an approaching storm. A few fleas having returned, the consul went to the bar for his change. The boy, not hearing apparently, sloped, slopped some mescal into his glass from the beautiful gourd, handing it back he upset the toothpicks. The consul said nothing further about the change for the moment. However, he made a mental note to order for his next drink something costing more than the fifty centavos he had already laid down. In this way, he saw himself gradually, gradually recovering his money. He argued absurdly with himself that it was necessary to remain for this alone. He knew there was another reason yet he couldn't place his finger on it. Every time the thought of Yvonne occurred to him, he was aware of this. He seemed indeed then as though he must stay for her sake, not because she would follow him here. No, she had gone. He'd let her go, finally. Hugh might come, though never she, not this time. Obviously, she would return home, and his mind could not travel beyond that point. But for something else now. He saw his change lying on the counter, the price of the Miss Gun not deducted from it. He pocketed it all and came to the door again. Now the situation was reversed. The boy would have to keep an eye on him. It lugubriously diverted him to imagine, for a few fleas' benefit, though half aware... The preoccupied boy was not watching him at all. He had assumed the blue expression peculiar to a certain type of drunkard, tepid with two drinks grudgingly on credit, gazing out of an empty saloon, an expression that pretends he hopes help, any kind of help may be, be beyond its way, friends, any kind of friends coming to rescue him. For life is always just around the corner, in the form of another drink at a new bar. Yet he really wants none of those things. Avand abandoned by his friends, as they by him, he knows that nothing but the crushing look of a creditor lives around that corner. Neither has he forfeited himself sufficiently to borrow more money, nor obtain more credit, nor does he like the liquor next door anyway. Why am I here, says the silence. What have I done, Empties the e echoes the emptiness. Why have I ruined myself in this willful manner? Chuckles the money in the till. Why have I been brought so low, Wheels, wheedles the thoroughfare. To which the only answer is, the square gave him no answer. The little town that had seemed empty was filling up as evening wore on. Occasionally a mustachioed officer swaggered past with a heavy gait, slapping his swagger stick on his leggings. People were returning from the cemeteries, though. Perhaps the procession would not pass for some time. A ragged platoon of soldiers were marching across the square. Bugles blared. The police, too, those who were not on strike, or had been pretending to be on duty at the graves, or the deputies. It was not easy to get the distinction between the police and the military clear in one's mind either, had arrived in force. 
conjurman friends, doubtless. The cor corporal was still writing at his table. It oddly reassured him. Two or three drinkers pushed their way past him into the farolito, tasseled sombreros on their backs, on the backs of their heads, holsters slapped to their thighs. Two beggars had arrived and were taking up posts outside the door under the tempestuous sky. One, legless, was dragging himself through the dust like a poor seal, but the other beggar, who boasted one leg, stood up stiffly, proudly, against the catina wall as if waiting to be shot. Then this beggar, with one leg, leaned forward. He dropped a coin into the legless man's outstretched hand. There were tears in the first beggar's eyes. The consul now observed that on his extreme right some unusual animals resembling geese, but large as camels, and skinless men, without heads, upon stilts, whose animal animated entrails jerked along the ground, were issuing out of the forest path the way he had come. He shut his eyes from this, and when he opened them, someone who looked a policeman was leading a horse up the path. That was all. He laughed, despite the policeman, then stopped, for he saw that the face of the reclining beggar was slowly changing to Senora Gregorio's, and now in turn to his mother's face, upon which appeared an expression of infinite pity and supplication. Closing his eyes again, standing there, glass in hand, he th thought for a minute, with freezing, detached, almost amused calm of the dreadful night, inevitably awaiting him, whether he drank much more or not, his room shaking with demonic or continue his room shaking with demonic orchestras the snatches of fearful tumultuous sleep interrupted by voices which were really dogs barking or by his own name being continually repeated by imaginary parties arriving the vicious shouting the strumming the slamming the pounding the bartling with insolent arch fiends, the avalanche breaking down the door, the proddings from under the bed and always outside, the cries, the wailing, the terrible music, the dark spinets, he returned to the bar. Dis Diostato, the elephant, had just entered from the back. The consul was watching him discard his black coat, hang it in the closet, then felt in the breast pocket of his spotless white shirt for a pipe protruding from it. He took this out and began to fill it with a package of country club El Buono Tono Tobacco. The consul remembered had now about his pipe. Here it was, no doubt about it. Si, si, miss there, he replied, listening with bent head to the consul's query. Claro, no. Maya Piper no inglesi. Monter si Piper. You were a borracho one day then. No, senor? Como no, said the consul. Twice a day. You was drunk three times a day, Diosado said, and his look, the insult, the implied extent of his downfall, penetrated the consul. Then you'll be going back to America now, he added, rummaging behind the bar. I, no, por qué? Diostato suddenly slapped a fat package of envelopes fastened with elastic on the bar counter. Es suyo? he asked directly. Where are the letters Joffrey Furman? The letters, the letters, the rope, till her heart broke. Here were the letters, here and nowhere else. These were the letters, and this the consul knew immediately without examining the envelopes. When he spoke, he could not recognize his own voice. Si, senor, muchas gracias, he said. De nada, senor. The God-given turned away. La rame inutil frag fatigua vainamente un mer immobil. The consul could not move for a full minute. He could not even make a move toward a drink. Then he began to trace sideways in spilled liquor a little map on the bar. The Osado came back and watched him with interest. España, the consul said. Then his Spanish failing him. Your Spanish, senor? Si, si, senor, si, said Diosdado, watching, but in a new tone. Español, España. These letters you gave me, see, are from my wife, my esposa. Glado, this is where we met, in Spain. You recognize it, your old home, you know, Andalusia? That up there, that's the Guadalquivir. Beyond that, the Sierra Morena. Down there's the Almeria. Those, he traced with his finger, lying between, are the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And there's Granada. That's the place, the very place we met, the consul smiled. Granada, said Diosdado, sharply, in a different, harder pronunciation to the consul's. He gave him a searching, an important, suspicious look, then left him again. Now he was speaking to a group at the other end of the bar. Faces were turned in the consul's direction. The consul carried another drink with Avon's letters into an inner room, one of the boxes in the Chinese puzzle. He hadn't remembered before they were framed in dull glass, like cashier's offers, offices in a bank. In this room, he was not readily, really surprised to find the old Tarascan woman of the Bay of Easter this morning. Her tequila, surrounded by dominoes, was set before her on the round table. Her chicken pecked among them. The consul wondered if they were her own, or if it was just necessary for her to have the dominoes wherever she happened to be. Her stick with the claw handle hung, as though alive, on the edge of the table. The consul moved toward her, drank half his mescal, took off his glasses, then slipped the elastic from the package. Do you remember tomorrow, he read, 
No, he thought. The words sank like stones in his mind. It was a fact he was losing touch with his situation. He was dissociated from himself, and at the same time he saw this plainly. The shock of receiving the letters having, in a sense, waked him, if only so to say, from one synabulism into another. He was drunk. He was sober. He had a hangover all at once. It was after six in the evening, yet whether it was being in the Fatalito or the presence of an old woman in this glass-framed room with, where an electric light was burning, he seemed back in the early morning again. It was almost as if he were yet another kind of drunkard in a different circumstances in another country to whom something quite different was happening. He was like a man who gets up half stupefied with liquor at dawn, chattering, Jesus, this is the kind of fellow I am, ugh, ugh, to see his wife off by an early bus, though it is too late. And there is a note on the breakfast table. Forgive me for being hysterical yesterday. Such an outburst was certainly not excused on any grounds of your having hurt me. Don't forget to bring in the milk. Beneath which he writes, almost as an afterthought, Darling, we can't go on like this. It's too awful. I'm leaving. And who, instead of perceiving the whole significance of this, remembers incongruously he told the barman at too great length last night how somebody's house burned down, and why he is told him where he lives, and that the police will be able to find him. And why is the barman's name Sherlock? Such an unforgivable name. And have a glass of port and water and three aspirin, which make him sick. Reflects that the same bar and apologize. In fact, that he has five hours before the pub opens where he must return to that same bar and apologize. But where did I put my cigarette? And why is my glass of port under the bathtub? Jesus. And was that an explosion I heard somewhere in the house? And, and encountering his accusing eyes in another mirror within the little room, the consul had the queer passing feeling he'd risen in bed to do this, that he'd sprung up and must give her Cory Lannis is dead, or muddle, 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 or I think it was, oh, oh, or something really senseless, like buckets, buckets, millions of buckets in the soup. And that he would now, though he was sitting quite calm in the Faralito, relapse once more upon the pillows to watch, shaking in impotent terror at himself, the beers and eyes form, foam, form in the curtains, or fill the space between wardrobe and ceiling, and hear, from the street, the soft padding of eternal ghostly policemen outside. Do you remember tomorrow? It is our wedding anniversary. I have not had one word from you since I left. God, it is the silence that frightens me. The consul drank some more mescal. It is the silence that frightens me, this silence. The consul read the sentence over and over again, the same sentence, the same letter, all the letters in vain as those arriving on shipboard in port for one lost at sea, because he found some difficulty in focusing. The words kept blurring and disassembling, his own name starting out at him, but the mescal had brought him in touch with the situation again to the extent that he did not now need to comprehend any meaning in the words beyond their abject confirmation of his own lostness, his own fruitful selfish ruin. Now perhaps finally self-imposed, his brain, for this crum cruelly disregarded evidence of what heartbreak he had caused her, at an agonized standstill. It is a silence that frightens me. I have pictured all sorts of tragic things befalling you. It is as though you were away at war and I were waiting, waiting for news of you, for the letter, for the telegram. But no war could have this power to so chill and terrify my heart. I send you all my love and my whole heart and my thoughts and prayers. The consul was aware, drinking, that the woman with the dominoes was trying to attract his attention, opening her mouth and pointing to it. Now she was suddenly moving around the table near him. Surely it must have a thought great, a great deal of us, what we built together, of how mindlessly we destroyed the structure and the beauty, but yet could not destroy the memory of that beauty. It has been this which has haunted me day and night. Turning, I see us in a hundred places with a hundred smiles. I come into a street and you are there. I creep at night to bed and you are waiting for me. What is this life? What is there in life besides the person whom one adores and the life one can build with that person? For the first time, I understand the meaning of suicide. God, how pointless and empty the world is. Days filled with cheap and tarnished moments succeed each other. Restless and haunted nights follow in bitter routine. The sun shines without brightness and the moon rises without light. My heart has the taste of ashes, and my throat is tight and weary with weeping. What is a lost soul? It is one that has turned from the, its true path and is groping in the darkness of remembered ways. The old woman was plucking at his sleeve in the console. Had Avon been reading the letters of Eloise and Elibard? Reached out to press an electric bell, the urbane yet violent presence of which in these odd little niches never failed to give him a shock. A moment later, a few fleas entered with a bottle of tequila in one hand and a mezcal cito cantal in the other, but he took the bottles away after pouring their drinks. The consul nodded to the old woman, motioned to her tequila, drank most of his mezcal, and resumed reading. 
He could not remember whether he had paid or not. Oh, Joffrey, how bitterly I regret it now. Why did we postpone it? Is it too late? I want your children soon. At once, I want them. I want your life filling and stirring me. I want your happiness beneath my heart and your sorrows in my eyes and your peace in the fingers of my hand. The consul paused. What was she saying? He rubbed his eyes, then fumbled for his cigarettes. Alas, the tragic word droned round the room like a bullet that passed through him. He read on, smoking. You are walking on the edge of an abyss where I may not follow. I wake to a darkness which I must follow myself endlessly, hating the eye who so eternally pursues and confronts me. If we could rise again from our misery, see each other once more, and find the solace of each other's lips and eyes, who is to stand between? Who can prevent? The consul stood up. Yvonne had certainly been reading something. Back to the old woman and went to the bar he'd imagined filling up behind him, but which was still fairly deserted. Who indeed was to stand between? He posted himself at the door again, as sometimes before in the deceptive violet dawn. Who indeed could prevent? Once more he stared at the square. The same ragged platoon of soldiers still seemed to be crossing it, as in some disrupted movie repeating itself. The corporeal still toiled at his copperplate handwriting under the archway. Only his lamp was alight. It was getting dark. The police were nowhere to be seen. Though by the barranca, the same soldier was still asleep under a tree. Or wasn't it a soldier, but something else? He looked away. Black clouds were boiling again. There was a distant breaking of thunder. He breathed the oppressive air in which there was a slight hint of coolness. Who indeed, even now, was to stand between, he thought desperately. Who indeed, even now, could prevent? He wanted Yvonne at this moment to take her in his arms, wanted more than ever to be forgiven and to forgive. But where should he go? Where would he find her now? The whole unlikely family of indeterminate class were strolling past the door, the grandfather in front, coercing, correcting his watch, peering at the dim barracks clock that still said six, the mother laughing and drawing her bosom over her head, mocking the probable storm. Up in the mountains, two drunken gods standing far apart were still engaged in an endlessly decisive, indecisive and wildly swinging game of bumble puppy with a Burmese gong. The father, by himself, smiling proudly, contem contemplatively, clicking his fingers, clicking a speck of dust now from his fine, brown, shiny boots. Two pretty children with limpid black eyes were walking between them hand in hand. Suddenly, the elder child freed her sister's hand and turned a succession of cartwheels in the lush grass plot. All of them were laughing. The consul hated to look at them. They'd gone away, thank God. Miser miserably, he wanted Yvonne and did not want her. Get a Maria, a voice spoke softly behind him. At first, he saw only the shapely legs of a girl who was leading him, now by the constricted power of aching flesh alone, a pathetic trembling of brutal lust, with little glass-paned rooms that grew smaller and smaller, darker and darker, until by the Nikitorio, the Senores, out of whose evil-smelling gloom broke a sinister chuckle, there was merely a lightless annex, no more, larger than a cupboard, in which two men whose faces he couldn't see either were sitting, drinking or plotting. Then it struck him that some reckless murderous power was drawing him in, on, forcing him, while he yet remained passionately aware of the all too possible consequences, and somehow, as innocently unconscious, to do with, without precaution or conscience what he would never be able to undo or gainsay, leading him irresistibly out of the garden. Lightning filled at this moment. It reminded him queerly of his own house, and also of El Popo, where earlier he had thought of going, only this was grimmer, the obverse of it. Leaning him through the open door to the darkened room, one of many givings of the patio. So this was it, the final stupid, unprophylactic rejection. He could prevent it even now. He would not prevent it. Yet perhaps his familiars or one of his voices might have some good advice. He looked about him, listening. Erectus Horibus. No voice came. Suddenly he laughed. It had been too clever of him to trick his voices. They didn't know he was here. The room itself, in which gleamed a single blue electric bulb, was not sorted. At first sight, it was a student's room. In fact, it closely resembled his old room at college, only this was more spacious. There were the same great doors and a bookcase in a familiar place, with a book open on top of the shelves. In one corner, incongruously, stood a giant saber. Kashmir, he pro he'd imagined he'd seen the world, that it had gone. Probably he had seen it, for the book, of all things, was a Spanish history of British India. The bed was disorderly and covered with bookmarks, even what appeared bloodstains, although this bed too seemed akin to his student's cot. He noticed by it an almost empty bottle of miscoff, but the floor was red flagstone, and somehow its cold, strong logic canceled the horror. He finished while addressing him. He finished the bottle. The girl who had been shutting the double doors while addressing him in some strange language, possibly Zapotecan, 
came toward him, and he saw she was young and pretty. Lightning silhouetted against the window of face, for a moment curiously like Yvonne's. Get him, Maria, she volunteered again, and flinging her arms around his neck, drew him down to her bed. Her body was Yvonne's, too. Her legs, her breasts, her pounding, passionate heart. Electricity crackled under her finger, fingers, run, under his fingers running over her. But the sentimental illusion was going. It was sinking into a sea, as though it had not been there. It had become the sea, a desolate horizon with one huge black sailing ship hull down, sweeping into the sunset, or her body was nothing, an abstraction merely, a calamity, a fiendish apparatus for calamitous sinking sensations. It was disaster. It was the horror of waking up in the morning in Oaxaca, his body fully clothed at half past three every morning after Yvonne had gone, Oaxaca, and the nightly escape from the sleeping Hotel Francia, where Yvonne and he had once been happy, from the cheap room giving on the balcony high up, to the El Infierno, that other Fadolito, of trying to find the bottle in the dark and failing, the vulture sitting in the wash basin, his steps, noiseless, dead silence outside the hotel room, too soon for the terrible sounds of squealing and slaughter, in the kitchen below, of going down the carpeted stairs to the huge dark well of the deserted dining room, once the patio, sinking into the soft disaster of the carpet, his feet sinking into heartbreak when he reached the stairs, still not sure he wasn't on the landing, in the stab and panic and self-disgust when he thought of the cold shower bath back on the left, used only once before, but that was enough, and the silent final trembling approach, respectable, his steps sinking into calamity, and it was this calamity he now, with Maria, penetrated. The only thing alive in him now, this burning, boiling, crucified, evil organ. God, is it possible to suffer more than this? Out of this suffering, something must be born, and what would be born was his own death. For ah, how alike are the groans of love to those of the dying? How alike those of love to those of the dying? And his steps sinking into his tremor, the sickening cold tremor, and into the dark wall of the dining room, with round the corner one dim light hovering above the desk, and the clock too early, and the letters unwritten, powerless to write, and the calendar saying eternally, powerlessly, their wedding anniversary, and the manager's nephew asleep on the couch, waiting to up to meet the early train from Mexico City, the darkness that muttering was palpable, the cold aching loneliness in the high sounding dining room, stiff with the dead white gray folded napkins, the weight of suffering and conscience greater, it seemed, than borne by any man that had survived, the thirst that was not thirst but itself heartbreak, and lust was death, death, and death again, and death awaiting in the cold hotel dining room, half whispering to him, waiting, since El Infierno, that other federalito, did not open till four in the morning, and one could scarcely wait outside. In this calamity he was now penetrating. It was calamity, the calamity of his own life. The very essence of it he now penetrated, was penetrating, penetrated. Waiting for the Infierno, whose one lamp of hope would soon be glowing behind the dark open sewers, on the table in the hotel dining room, difficult to distinguish, a carafe of water, trembling, trembling, carrying the carafe to its water to his lips, but not far enough. It was too heavy, like his burden of sorrow. You could not drink of it. He could only moisten his lips, and then, it must have been Jesus who sent this. It was only he who was following me, after all. The bottle of French wine from Selena Cruz, still standing on the table, set for breakfast, marked with someone else's room number, uncorked with difficulty, and, watching to see the nephew wasn't watching, holding it with both hands, and letting the blessed eye card trickle down his throat just a little, for after all, one was an Englishman, still sporting, and then subsiding on the couch, too. His heart, a cold ache warm to one side, into a cold, shivering shell of palpitating loneliness. Yet feeling the wine slightly more, as if one's chest were being filled with boiling ice now, or there was a bar of red-hot iron across one's chest, but cold in its effect, for the conscious that, consciousness, conscience that rages underneath anew and is bursting one's heart burns so fiercely with the fires of a hell, a bar of red-hot irons is a mere chill to it and the clock ticking forward, with his heart beating now like a snow-muffled drum, tickling, shaking, time shaking and tickling towards El Infierno. Then, the escape, drawing the blanket he had secretly brought down from the hotel room over his head, creeping up past the manager's nephew. The escape, past the hotel desk, not daring to look for mail. Is it the silence that frightens me? Can it be there? Is it me? Alas, self-pitying, miserable wretch, you old rascal. Past the escape, the Indian night watchman sleeping on the floor in the doorway and like an Indian himself now, clutching the few pesos he had left, out into the cold, walled, cobbled city, past the escape of the secret passage, the open sewers and the mean streets, the few lone, dim street lamps, into the night, into the miracle of the coffins of the houses, the landmarks were still there, the escape down poor broken sidewalks, groaning, groaning, and how alike are the groans of love to those of the dying, how alike those of love to those of the dying, and the house is so still, so cold before dawn, till he saw, round in the corner, the one lamp of El Infierno glowing, that was so like the farolito, 
Then, surprised once more, he could never have reached it, standing inside the place with his back to the wall and his blanket still over his head, talking to the beggars, the early workers, the dirty prostitutes, the pimps, the debris and detritus of the streets, and the bottom of the earth. But who are yet so much higher than he, drinking just he a drug here in the far lito, and telling lies, lying, the escape, still the escape, under lilac-shaded dawn that should have brought death, and here, and he should have died now too. What have I done? The consul's eyes focused on the calendar behind the bed. He had reached his crisis at last, a crisis without possession, almost without pleasure finally, and what he saw might have been, no, he sure was, a picture of Canada. Under a brilliant full moon, a stag stood by a river down which a man and a woman were paddling a birch bark canoe. The calendar was set to the future, for next month, December. Where would he be then? In the dim blue light, he even made out the names of the saints for each December day, printed by the numerals. Nadalia, Bibiana, Xavier, Sabas, Beri, Ambrosio. Thunder blew the door open. The face of Laurel faded into the door. In the Mintigorio, a stench like the Mercaptan clapped yellow hands on his face, and now, from the urinal walls, uninvited, he heard his voices again, hissing and shrieking and yammering at him. Now you've done it. Now you've really done it, Joffrey Fermian. Even we can help you no longer. Just the same, you might as well make the most of it now. The night's still young. You like Maria? You like? A man's voice, that of the chuckler, he recognized, came from the gloom of the console. His knees trembling, glazed around him. Gazed around him. All I saw at first were slashed advertisements on the slimly, slimy feeble walls. Glinica, Dr. Virgil. Enfermedades sec secretas de ambos sexos, vías urinarias, trastornos sexuales, debilidad sexual, derrames nocturnos, emisiones prematuras, espermatura, impotencia, sex, sex, sex. His versatile companion of this morning and last night might have been informing him ironically all was not yet lost. Unfortunately, by now, he would be well on his way to Guanajuato. He distinguished an incredibly filthy man sitting hunched in the corner of the lavatory seat, so short his trouser feet didn't reach the leader littered the fouled floor. You like Maria, this man croaked again? I send, mi amigo, he farted. Mi friend Englishman all time, all time. Que hora, asked the consul, shivering, noticing in the t in the runnel, a dead scorpion, a sparkle of phosphorescence and it had gone, or it had never been there. What time? Sick, answered the man. No, it there, half past six by the cock. You mean half past six by the clock. Si, senor, half past six by the cock. Six o oh, six. the proprietor Pete Root, pickled beetroot. The consul, arranging his dress, left grimly at the pimp's reply. Or was he some sort of stool pigeon, in the strictest sense of that term? And who was it that said earlier, half past three by the cock? How had the man known he was English, he wondered, taking his laughter back through the glass pine, pin, paned rooms, out through the filing bar to the door again. Perhaps he worked for the Union Militar, squatting at the stool all day in the Securidad Jake's eavesdropping on the prisoners' conversations, while pimping was just a sideline. He might have found out about him from Maria, whether she was but he didn't want to know. He'd been right about the time. So, the clock on the Comissaria de Policia, Anulad, imperfectively luminous, said, as if it had just moved forward with a jerk, a little after 6.30, and the consul corrected his watch, which was slow. It was now quite dark, yet the same ragged platoon still seemed to be marching across the square. The corporal was no longer writing, however. Outside the prison stood a single, motionless sentinel. The archway behind him was suddenly slept, swept by wild light. Beyond, by the cells, the shadow of a policeman's lantern was swinging against the wall. The evening was filled with odd noises, like those of sleep. The roll of a drum somewhere was a revolution. A cry down the street of someone being murdered. Brakes grinding far away, a soul in pain. The plucked cords of guitar hanging over his head. A bell clanged frantically in the distance. Lightning twitched. Half past six by the cock. In British Columbia, in Canada, on cold Pineus Lake, where his island had long since become a wilderness of laurel and Indian pipe, of wild strawberry and Oregon holly, he remembered the strange Indian belief prevailing that a cock would crow over a drowned body. How dread the validation that silver February evening long ago when, acting as Lithuanian consul de Vernon, he had accomplished a search party in the boat, and the bored rooster had roused himself to crow shrilly seven times. The dynamite charges had apparently disturbed nothing. They were somber somberly rowing for the shore through the cloudy twilight, when suddenly, protruding from the water, they had seen what looked at first like a glove, the hand of a drowned Lithuanian. 
British Columbia, the genteel Siberia that was neither genteel nor Siberia, but an undiscovered, perhaps undiscoverable paradise that might have been a solution to return there to build if not on the island, somewhere there, a new life with Yvonne. Why hadn't he thought of it before? Or why hadn't she? Or that had that been where she was getting at this afternoon, and which had half communicated itself to his mind? My little gray home in the west. Now it seemed to him he had often thought of it before, in this precise spot where he was standing. But now, too, at least this much was clear. He couldn't go back to Yvonne if he wanted to. The hope of ending new life together, even if it were miraculously offered again, could scarcely survive in the arid air of an estranged postponement to which it must now, on top of everything else, be submitted for brutal hygienic reasons alone. True, those reasons were without quite secure basis yet, but for another purpose that eluded him, they had to remain unassailable. All solutions now came up against their great Chinese wall, forgiveness among them. He laughed once more, feeling a strange release, almost a sense of attainment. His mind was clear. Physically, he seemed better, too. It was as if, out of an ultimate contamination, he had derived strength. He felt free to devour what remained of his life at peace. At the same time, a certain gruesome gaiety was creeping into his mood, and in, in an extraordinary way, a certain light-headed mischievousness. He was aware of a desire at once for complete, blooded oblivion and for innocent, youthful fling. Alas, a voice seemed to be saying, My poor child, you do not feel any of these things, really. Only lost, only homeless. He started. In front of him, tied to a small tree he hadn't noticed, though it was right opposite the cantina on the other side of the path, stood a horse cropping the lush grass. Something familiar about the beast made him walk over. Yes, he thought. He could mistake by now neither the number seven branded on the rump nor the leather saddle characterized in that fashion. It was the Indian's horse, the horse of the man he'd first seen riding today and singing into the sunlit world, then abandoned, left dying by the roadside. He patted the animal, which twitched his ears and went on cropping imperturbably. perhaps not so imperturbably. At a rumble of thunder, the horse, whose saddlebags he'd noticed had been mysteriously restored, whinnied uneasily, shaking all over, when just as mysteriously those saddlebags no longer chinked. Unbided, an explanation of this afternoon's events came to the consul. Hadn't it turned out to be a policeman into which all these abominations he'd observed a little while since had melted? A policeman leading a horse in this direction? Why should that, not that horse be his, this horse? It had been those vigilante hombres who'd turned up on the road this afternoon, and here, in Parian, as he told Hugh, was their headquarters. How he would relish in this, could he be here? The police, ah, oh, the fearful police, or rather not the real police, he corrected himself, but those Union Militar fellows were at the bottom, in an insanely complicated manner, but still the bottom of this whole business. He felt suddenly sure of this, as if out of some correspondence between the subnormal world itself and the abnormally subconscious delirious one within him held the truth, had sprung, sprung like a shadow, however, which, Gayasi Isai, nada, he said, and smiled the man resembling a Mexican sergeant of police who had snatched the bridle from his hands. Nothing. Veo que la tierra anda. Estoy esperando que pase mi casa por aquí para meterme en ella, he brilliantly managed. The brasswork on the amazed policeman's bu uniform buckles caught the light from the doorway of the farolito. Then, as he turned, the leather on his Sam Brown caught it, so that it was glossy as a platinum leaf, and lastly his boots, which shone like dull silver. The consul laughed. Just to glance at him was to feel that mankind was on the point of being saved immediately. He repeated the good Mexican joke, not quite right, in English, patting the policeman, whose jaw had dropped with bewilderment, and who's eyeing him blankly, who was eyeing him blankly on the arm. I learned that the world goes round, so I am waiting here for my new house to pass by. He held out his hand. Amigo, he said. The policeman grunted, brushing the consul's hand off. Then, giving him quick, suspicious glances over his shoulder, he fasted, fastened the horse more securely to the tree. In those swift glances, there was something serious indeed, the consul was aware, something that bade him escape the, at his peril. Slightly hurt, he now remembered, too, the look Diostato had given him, but the consul felt neither serious nor like escaping, nor did his feelings change as he found himself impelled by the policeman from being behind towards the cantina, beyond which, by lightning, the east briefly appeared in onrush, a towering thunderhead. Preceding him through the door, it actually struck the consul that the sergeant was trying to be polite.
He stood aside quite nimbly, bidding with a gesture the other go first. Mi amigo, he repeated. The policeman shoved him, and they made for one of the bar which is empty. Americano, eh? The policeman said now, firmly. Wait aquí. Comprende, senor? He went behind the bar to speak with Diosdado. The consul unsuccessfully tried to interlude, on his conduct's behalf, a cordial note of explanation for the elephant, who appeared grim as if he just murdered another of his wives to cure her neurothesis. Meantime, a few fleas, temporary otios, and with surprising clarity, slid him a mescal along the counter. People were looking at him again. The policeman, then the policeman confronted him from the other side of the bar. They say that he's trouble about you no pay, he said. You no pay for a Mexican whiskey. You no pay for Mexican girl. You have money, eh? Zicker said the consul, whose Spanish, in spite of a temporary insurgence, he knew virtually gone. Si, yes, mucho dinero. He added, placing a peso on the counter for a few fleas. He saw that the policeman was a heavy-necked, handsome man with a black, gritty mustache, flashing teeth, and a rather consciously swashbuckling manner. He was joined at this moment by a tall, slim man in a well-cut American tweeds, with a hard, somber face and long, beautiful hands. Glancing periodically at the consul, he spoke in undertones with Diosdado and the policeman. This man, who looked purebred Castilian, seemed familiar, and the consul wondered where he'd seen him before. The policeman disengaged himself from him, leaned over with his elbows at the bar, talking to the consul. You have no money, hey? And now you steal my horse. He went to the god-given. What for you, a runaway with Mexicano caballo? Fortuno pay Mexican money, hey? The consul stared at him. No, decidedly not. Of course I wasn't going to steal your horse. I was merely looking at it, admiring it. What you want for look at Mexican caballo, for why? The policeman laughed suddenly, with real merriment, slapping his thighs. Obviously, he was a good fellow, and the consul, feeling the ice is broken, laughed too. But the policeman, obviously enough, was also quite drunk, so it was difficult to gauge the quality of this laughter. While the faces of both Diosdado and the man in tweeds remained black and stern. You take a map, make a map of the Spain, the policeman persisted, persisted, controlling his laughter finally. You know a Spain? Come at non, the consul said. So Diosdado told him about the map, yet surely... There was an innocently sad enough thing to have done. We, oui, es muy asombrosa. No, this wasn't Pernambuco. Certainly, no, definitely, he ought not speak to, <laughs> to speak Portuguese. Ja, well, correcto, senor, he's finished. Yes, I know Spain. You make the uh, map of Spain? You Bolshevik, you pick? You member of Brigade Internacionale and stir up trouble? No, answered the consul firmly, decently, but now somewhat agitated. Absolutamente no. Absolutamente, hey? The policeman, with another wink at Diosdado, imitated the consul's manner. He came round to the correct side of the bar again, bringing the somber man with him who didn't say a word and drank, but merely stood there, looking stern, as did the elephant opposite them now, angrily drawing glasses. All he drawled, and right, the policeman added with tremendous emphasis, slapping the consul on the back. All right, come on, my friend, he invited him. Drink. Drink all you all want to have. We have been looking for you. He went on in a loud, half-bantering, half-drunken tone. You have murdered a man and escaped through seven states. We want to found out about you. We have found it out. Is it right you desert your ship at Vera Cruz? You say you have money. How much money have you got? The consul took out a crumpled note and placed it in his pocket. Fifty pesos, hey? Perhaps that is not enough money. What are you for? Inglés, Espanol, Americano, Aleman, Russisch? You come from the URSAS. What are you for do? I know speaker de English. Hey, what's your name? Someone else asked him loudly at his elbow, and the consul turned to see another policeman dressed much like the first, only shorter, heavy jowled, with cool little eyes and an ashen, pulpy, clean shaven face. Though he carried sidearms, both his trigger fingers Though he carried sidearms, both his trigger finger and his right thumb were missing. As he spoke, he made an obscene rolling movement of his hips and went to the first policeman, and a Diosdado, avoiding, though avoiding the eyes of the man in tweeds. Procesión al culo, he added, for no reason the consul knew of, still rolling his hips. He is the chief of municipality, the first policeman explained heartily to the consul. This man want to know I your name. Como se llama? Yes, what's your name? shouted the second policeman, who had taken a drink from the bar, but not looking at the consul and still rolling his hips. Trotsky gibbed someone from the far end of the counter, and the consul, beard conscious, flushed. Blackstone, he answered gravely, and indeed, he asked himself, accepting another miscall, had he not and with a vengeance come to live among the Indians? The only trouble was one was very much afraid these particular Indians might turn out to be people with ideas too. William Blackstone. Why I argue, shouted the fat policeman, whose own name was something like Zuzugoitea. What are you for? And he repeated the catechism of the first policeman, who seemed to imitate in everything. Inglés, Aleman? The consul shook his head. No, just William Blackstone. You are Juden? 
the policeman demanded. No, just Blackstone, the consul repeated, shaking his head. William Blackstone. Jews are seldom very borracho. You are a uh, borracho, hey? The first policeman said, and everyone laughed. Several others, his henchmen evidently, had joined them, though the consul couldn't distinguish them clearly, save the inflexible and different man in tweeds. He is the chief of gardens, the first policeman explained, continuing. This man is jefe de jardineros. And there was a certain awe in his tone. I am chief too. I am chief of rostrums, he added, but almost reflectively, as if he meant I am only chief of rostrums. And I began the consul. Y yo, repeated the con or and perfectamente borracho, finished the first policeman, and everyone roared again, save the jefe de jardineros. Y yo, repeated the consul, but what was he saying, and who were these people really? Chief of what rostrums? Chief of what municipality? Above all, chief of what gardens? Surely the silent men in tweeds, sinister too, though apparently the only one unarmed in the group, wasn't responsible for all those little public gardens. Albeit the consul was prompted by a shadowy presence he already had concerning the claimants. To these titular pretensions, there were also they were associated in his mind with the inspector general of the state, and also he had told Hugh with the Union Militar. Doubtless he'd seen them be here before in one of the rooms or at the bar, but certainly never at such close quarters as this. However, so many questions he was unable to answer were being showered upon him by so many different people, the significance was almost forgotten. He gathered, though, that the respected chief of gardens, to whom at this moment he sent a mute appeal for help, might be even higher than the inspector general himself. The appeal was answered by a blacker look than ever. At the same time, the consul knew where he'd seen him before. The chief of gardens might have been the image of himself when, lean, bronze, serious, beardless, and the crossroads of his career, he had assumed the vice consulship in Granada. Innumerable tequilas and mezcals were being brought, and the consul drank everything in sight without regard for ownership. It is not enough to say they were at El Amor de los Amores together, he heard himself repeating. It must have been in, answer to some insistent demand for the story of his afternoon, though why he, it should be made at all he didn't know. What matters is how the thing happened. Was it the peon, perhaps? He wasn't quite a peon. Drunk? Or did he fall from his horse? Perhaps the thief just recognized a boon companion who owed him a drink or two. Thunder growled outside the farolito. He sat down. It was an order. Everything was growing very chaotic. The bar was now nearly full. Some of the drinkers had come from the graveyards. Indians in loose-fitting clothes. There were dilapidated soldiers with them. Among them here and there, and more smartly dressed officer. He distinguished in the glass rooms bugles and green lariats moving. Several dancers had entered dressed in long black cloaks, streaked with luminous paint. To represent skeletons, the chief of municipality was standing behind him now. The chief of Rostrum was stand standing too, taking on his right with the jefe de jardineros, whose name the consul had discovered was Fructuso Sanabria. Hello, que tal? asked the consul. Someone was sitting next to him with his back half turned, who also seemed familiar. He looked like a poet, some friend of his college days. Fair hair fell over his fine forehead. The consul offered him a drink, which this young man not only refused in Spanish, but rose to refuse, making a gesture with his hand of pushing the consul away, then moving with angry, half averted face to the far end of the bar. The consul was hurt. Again, he said a mute appeal to help to the chief of gardens. He was answered by an implacable and almost final look. For the first time, the consul scented the tangibility of his danger. He knew Sanabria and the first policeman were discussing him in the utmost hostility, deciding what to do with him. Then they saw that they were trying to catch the chief of municipality's attention. They were breasting their way, just the two of them, behind the bar again to a telephone he hadn't noticed. And the curious thing about the telephone was that it seemed to be working properly. The chief of Rostrums did this talking. Sanabria stood by grimly, apparently giving instructions. They were taking their time and realizing the call would be about him, whatever its nature, the consul, with the slow burning pain of apprehension, felt again how lonely he was, that all around him, in spite of the crowd, the uproar, slightly muted at a gesture from Sanabria, stretched to solitude like the wilderness of gray 
heaving Atlantic conjured to his eyes a little white, a little while since with Maria. Only this time no sail was in sight. The mood of mischief, mischievousness and release had vanished completely. He knew he'd half hoped all along Yvonne would come to rescue him. Knew now it was too late that she would not come. Ah, Yvonne, if only as a daughter who would ever understand and comfort him, could only be at his side now. Even but if to lead him by the hand, drunkenly homeward through the stone fields, the forest, not interfering, of course, with his occasional pulse of the bottle, and ah, those burning draughts and loneliness, he would miss them. Were those burning draughts wherever he was going, and they were perhaps the happiest thing in his life had known. He had seen the Indian children lead their fathers. home on Sundays. Instantly, consciously, he forgot Yvonne again. He ran his head. It ran on his head. He could perhaps leave the Fadalito at this moment by himself. Unnoticed and without difficulty. For the chief of municipality was still deep in conversation while the backs of the two policemen at the telephone returned, yet he made no move. Instead, his elbows on the bar, he buried his face in his hands. He saw again in his mind's eye that extraordinary picture on Laurel's wall, Los Borrachones, only now it took on a somewhat different aspect. Might it have been another meaning that the picture, unintentional as its humor, beyond the symbolically obvious? He saw those people like spirits appearing to grow more free, more separate, their distinctive noble faces Their distinctive noble faces more distinctive, more noble. The higher they ascended into the light, those florid people resembling cuddled fiends, becoming more like each other, more joined together, more as one fiend. More as one fiend, the further down they hurled into the darkness. Perhaps all this wasn't so ludicrous. When he had striven upward, as at the beginning with Yvonne, had not the features of life seemed to grow more clear, more animated, friends and enemies more identifiable, special problems, scenes, and with them the sense of his own reality, more separate from himself, and had it not turned out that the further down he sank, the more these features had tended to dis dissemble, to cloy and chudder, to be become finally little better than ghastly characters, caricatures of his dissimulating inner and outer self, or of his struggle, if struggle there were still. Yes, but he had denied it willed it, the very material world, illusory that it was, might have been a confederate, pointing the wise way. Here would be no devolving through failing, unreal voices and forms of dissolution that became more and more like one voice to a death, more dead than death itself, but an infinite widening, an infinite evolving and extension of boundaries, in which the spirit was an entity, perfect and whole. Ah, who knows why man, however beset his chance by lies, has been offered love. Yet it had not to be faced down. Down he had gone, down till. It was not the bottom even now, he realized. It was not quite end yet. It was as if his fall had been broken by a narrow ledge, a ledge from which he could neither climb up nor down, on which he lay bloody and half stunned, while far below him the abyss yawned, waiting. And it was as he lay surrounded in delirium by these phantoms of himself, the policeman, Fructosa Sanabia, that other man who looked like a poet, the luminous skeletons, even the rabbit in the corner and the ash in the sputum on the filthy floor, did not each correspond in a way he couldn't understand yet obscurely recognized to some faction of his being. And he dimly saw, too, how Yvonne's arrival, the snake in the garden, his quarrel with Laurel, and later with Hugh and Yvonne, the infernal machine, his encounter with Signora Gregorio, the finding of the letters, and much beside, how all these events of the day, indeed, had been as indifferent tufts of the grass. He had hep heartedly clutched at our stones loosened on his downward flight, which were still showering on him from above. The consul produced his blue package of cigarettes with wings on them. Alas, he raised his head again. No, he was where he was. There was nowhere to fly to, and it was as if a, as if a black dog had settled on his back, pr pressing him to his seat. The chief of gardens and the chief of rostrums were still waiting by the telephone, perhaps for the right number. Probably they would be calling the inspector general. What if they'd forgotten him, the consul? What if they'd forgotten... What if they weren't phoning about him at all? He remembered his dark glasses he had removed to read Yvonne's letters, and some fatuous notion of disguise crossing his mind put them back on. Behind him, the chief of municipality was still engrossed. Now once more he could go. 
With the aid of his dark glasses, what could be simpler? He could go, only he needed another drink, one for the road. Moreover, he realized he was wedged between a solid mass of people and that, to make matters worse, a man sitting at the bar next to him was wearing a dirty sombrero on the back of his head and a cartridge belt hanging low to his trousers and clutched him by the arm affectionately. It was the pimp, the stool pigeon of the Mintigorio, hunched in almost precisely the same posture as before. He had apparently been talking to him for the last five minutes. My friend for my, he was babbling, all these men, nothing for me or for, or for you. All these men, nothing for you or for me. All these men, son of a bitch, sure, you are Englishman. He clutched the contest arm more firmly. All my, Mexican men, all tiny, next, all tiny Englishmen, my friend, Mexican. I don't care, son of a bitch, American. No good for you or for me. My Mexican all the time. All time, all time, eh? The consul withdrew his arm, but it was immediately clutched on his left by a man of uncertain nationality, cross-eyed with a drink, who resembled a sailor. You lie me, he stared flatly, swiveling round his stool. The consul freed himself. The pin clutched him again. Almost for succor, he gazed about them. The chief of municipalities was still engaged. In the bar, the chief of Rostrums was telephoning once more. Sanabaria stood at his elbow, directing. Squeezed against the pimp's chair, another man the consul took for American, who was continually squinting, squinting over his shoulder as though expecting somebody, was saying to no one in especial, Winchester, hell, that's something else. Don't tell me. right -o. The black swan is in Winchester. They captured me on the German side of the camp, and at the same time the, of the place where they captured me as a girl school, a girl teacher, she gave it to me, and you can take it, and you can have it. Ah, said the pimp, still clutching the console. He was speaking across him, half to the sailor. My friend, was a matter of you. My is looking for you all the time, my England man. All time, all time, sure, sure. The man is telling me my friend for you all the time. This man very much money. This man right or wrong, sure. American goddamn son of a bitch for you or me, or for any time. The consul was drinking with these macabre people inextricably. When he gazed round on this occasion, he met, cognizant of him, the chief of municipality's hard little cruel eyes. He gave up trying to understand what the illiterate sailor, who seemed an even obscurer fellow than the stool pigeon, was talking about. He consulted his watch, still only a quarter to seven. Time was circumfluent again, too. Mescal drugged. Feeling the eyes of one Senor Zuzu Goitea still boring into his neck, he produced one more, importantly defensively, Yvonne's letters. With his dark glasses on, they appeared for some reason clearer. And the off of man here, what there will be, let the Lord with us all time, bellowed the sailor. There's my religion, spoke in few words. Mozart was the man that writ the Bible. Mozart wrote the Old Testimony. Stay by that, and you'll all write. Mozart was a lawyer. Without you, I am cast out, severed. I am outcast for myself, a shadow. Weber's my name. They captured me in Flanders. You would doubt me more or less, but they, cap they captured me now. We ask nobody no questions because there we don't run. Christ, if you want to get them, go ahead and take them. But if you want Alabama, that bunch, the consul looked up. The man Weber was singing. I'm just a country boy. I don't know a damn thing. He splitted his reflection in the mirror. Soldat de la Legion Etranier. Then I met some of these people I must tell you about. For perhaps the thought of these people held before us like a prayer, their absolution may strengthen us once more to nourish the flame which can never go out, but burns now so fearfully low. Yes, sir, Mozart was a lawyer, and don't dispute me no more. Here, off, here to the off of God, I would dispute my incomprehensible stuff. De la Legion Extraordinary, Mar Cantabrio. You are one born to walk the light. Plunging your head out of the white sky, you flounder in an alien element. Oops. The voice of the stool pigeon was now became clear, rising above. Of the babble, he thought, the confusion of tongues. Remembering again as he distinguished the sailor's remote returning voice, the trip to Cholula. You are telling me or I am telling you. Japan no good for U.S., for America. No bueno. 
Mexican, dieciocho. I'll time Mexican go to work for US. Sure, sure, yes. Give me a cigarette for me. Give me a match for my Mexican work on to England. Where are you, Joffrey? If only I knew where you were. If only I knew what you wanted me. You know I would have long since been with you, for my life is irrevocably and forever bound to yours. Never think that by releasing me you will be free. You will only condemn us to an ultimate hell on earth. You will only fright free something else to destroy us both. I am frightened, Joffrey. Why do you not tell me what has happened? What do you need? And my God, what do you wait for? What release can be compared to the release of love? My thighs ache to embrace you. The emptiness of my body is famished in need of you. My tongue is dry in my mouth for the want of our speech. If you let anything happen to yourself, you'll be harming my flesh and mind. I'm in your hands now. Save. Mexican works. England works. Mexican works. Sure. French works. Why speak English? My Mexican. Mexican United States. He sees Negros. De Comprende. Detroit. Houston. Dallas. Quiere usted la salvación de México? Quiere usted la cruz de nuestro rey? No. The consul looked up, pocketing his letters. Someone near him was playing a fiddle loudly. A patriarchal, toothless old Mexican with a thin, wiry beard, encouraged ironically from behind the chief of municipality, was sawing away almost in his ear the star-spangled banner, but he was also saying something to privately. Americano, this bad place for you. These hombres malos, cacos, bad people here, brutos, no bueno for anyone, comprendo, I am a potter, he pursued urgently, his face close to the consoles. I take you to my home, I wait outside. The old man, still playing wildly, though rather out of tune, had gone. Way was being made for him through the crowd, but his place, somehow between the console of the pimp, had been taken by an old woman who, though respectably dressed with a finer bolso thrown over her shoulders, was behaving in a distressing fashion, clenching her hand restlessly into the consul's pocket, which he as restlessly removed, thinking she wanted to rob them. Then she realized. Then he realized she too wanted to help. No good for you, she whispered. Bad place. Muy malo. These men no friend of Mexican people. She nodded toward the bar in which the chief of Rose Trump's and Santa Bia still stood. They no policia, the diablos, murderers. He killed ten old men. He killed twenty viejos. She peered behind her nervously to see if the chief of municipality was watching her, and took from her shawl a clockwork skeleton. She set this on the counter before a few fleas, who were watching intently, munching a Mars pan coffin. Vamanos, she said to the consul, as the skeleton set in motion, jigged on the bar to collapse placidly. The consul only raised a glass. Gracias, buena amiga, he said, without expression. Then the old woman had gone. Meantime, the conversation about him had grown even more foolish and intemperate. The pimp was pawing at the consul from the other side, where the sailor had been. The Ostada was serving Ochas, raw alcohol, and steaming herb tea that was the punch and smell, too, from glass rooms of marijuana. All these men and women telling me, these men, my friend, for you, I make gusta, gusta, gusta. You like me? I pay for these men all time. The pimp rebuked the legionnaire, who was on the point of offering the consul a drink. My friend of England, man. My friend Mexican all. American no good for me, no. American no good for Mexican. These donkey, these men. No sabi nada. They pay for all your drinking. No, you know American? You England? Okay. Light for your pipe? No gracias, the consul said, lighting it himself and looking meaningly at the Diostado, from whose sure pocket his other pipe was protruding again. I happen to be American, and I'm getting rather bored by your insults. ¿Quiere usted la salvación de México? ¿Quiere usted la crisis de nuestro? No. These donkey. Goddamn son of a bitch for my. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, twelve, seven. It's a long, longy, longy. Wait for Tipperer. Noche en Abirino. Bolshevin. Buenas tardes, senores. The consul greeted the chief of Hardiniers. Hardens. Jar. What? The consul greeted the chief of gardens. The chief of Rostrums returning from the phone. They were standing beside him. Soon preposterous things were being said between them again without adequate reason. Answers, it seemed to him, given by questions that while they had perhaps not asked, nevertheless hung in the air. And for some answers others gave, when he turned round, no one was there. Lingering, the bar was emptying for La Comida. Yet a handful of mysterious strangers had already entered to take the other's place. No thought of an escape now touched the consul's mind. Both his will, at the time, which hadn't advanced five minutes since he was last conscious of it, were paralyzed. The consul saw someone who recognized the driver of the bus that afternoon. He had arrived at that stage of drunkenness where it becomes necessary to shake hands with everyone. The consul too found himself shaking hands with the driver. Donde esta vuestras palomas? he asked him. Suddenly, at a nod from Santa Bria, the chief of Rostrum's plunged his hands into the consul's pocket. Time you pay for all Mexican wiki, he said aloud, taking out the consul's note case with the wink of Diostato. The chief of the municipality made his obscene circular movement of the hips. Progresión al cuco, he began. The chief of Rostrum's had abstracted the package of Avon's letters. He glanced sideways at them without removing the elastic the consul had replaced. Chingago, cabrón. His eyes consulted Sanabria, who, silent, stern, nodded again. 
The chief brought out another pack of paper and a card he didn't know he possessed from the consul's jacket pocket. The three policemen put their heads together over the bar reading the paper. Now the consul, baffled, was reading the paper himself. Daily, Lundra Spesse, collect anti-Semitic campaign, Max Press Pepsion, textile manufacturers, unquote, German behind interior words. What was this? News, Jews, country belief, power ends conscious, unquote, stop screaming. No, Blackstone, the consul said. Komasayama, your name is Freeman. It says there. It says you are Yudan. I don't give a damn what it says anywhere. My name's Blackstone, and I'm not a journalist. True, Beto, I'm a writer. An escritor, only on economic matters. The council wound up. Where are your papers? Why you not have papers? The chief of restrooms asked, pocketing his cable. Where are your pasaporte? Why you need for mink disguise? The consul removed his dark glasses. Mutely to him, between sardonic thumb and forefinger, the chief of gardens held out the card. Federación Anarquistia Iberica, it said. Senor Hugo Firmin. No comprendo. The consul took the card and turned it over. Blackstone's my name. I'm a writer, not an anarchist. Writer, you are the Cristo. See you on the Cristo brick. The chief of Rostrum snatched back the card and pocketed it. And you then, he added. He slipped the elastic from Avon's letters and, moistening his thumb, ran through them, glancing sideways once more at the envelopes. Jingar, what for you tell lies? He said to you almost sorrow sorrowfully. Cabron, what for you lie? It says here too, your name Fearman. It struck the consul the legionnaire Weber, who was still in the bar, though at a distance, was staring at him with remote speculation, but he looked away again. The chief of municipality regarded the consul's watch, which he held in the palm of one mutilated hand, while he scratched himself between the thighs of the other, fiercely. Here, Oiga, the chief of Rostrums would do a ten peso note from the consul's case, cracked it, and threw it on the counter. Jingao. Winking at Diosdado, he replaced the case in his own pocket with the consul's other things. Then Sambaria spoke to him for the first time. I'm afraid you must come to prison, he said in simple English. He went back to the phone. The chief of municipality rolled his hips and gripped the consul's arm. The consul shouted at Diosdado in Spanish, shaking himself loose. He managed to reach his hand over the bar, but Diosdado struck it away. A few fleas began to yap. A sudden noise from the corner startled everyone. Yvonne and Hugh, perhaps, at last. He turned around quickly, still free of the chief. It was only the uncontrollable face on the bar barroom floor, the rabbit, having a nervous convulsion, trembling all over, wrinkling its nose and scuffling disapprovingly. The consul caught sight of the old woman with the rebozo. Loyally, she hadn't gone. She was shaking her head at him, frowning sadly, and now he realized she was the same old woman who died the dominoes. What for you lie, the chief of Rostrum repeated in a glowering voice. You say your name is Black, no it's Black. He shoved him backward towards the door. You say you are a writer, he shoved him again. You are no writer. He pushed the consul more violently, but the consul stood his ground. You are no de writer, you are de spider, and we shoot a de spiders in Mexico. Some military policemen watched with concern. The newcomers were breaking up. Two pariah dogs ran around in the bar. A woman clutched her baby to her, terrified. You know a writer, the chief caught him by the throat. You are Capone, you are Ju Chingago. Chingayo. The consul shook himself free again. You are a spider. Abruptly the radio, which, as Santa Bria finished with the phone again, Diosdado had turned to full blast. Shouted in Spanish, the consul translated it to himself in a flash, like the orders yelled in a gale of wind, the only orders that will save the ship. Incalculable are the benefits civilization has brought to us, incommensurable the productive powers of all classes of riches originated by inventions and discoveries of science, inconceivable the marvelous creations of the human sex in order to make men more happy, more free, and more perfect. Without parallel, the crystalline and fecund foundations of the new life, which still remains close to the thirsty lips of the people who will follow in their group, gripping and bestial tasks. Suddenly, before the consul, thought he saw an enormous rooster flapping before him, cawing, clawing, and croning. He raised his hands and it murdered on his face. He struck the returning Jefe de Jardinero straight between the eyes. Give me those letters back, he heard himself shouting at the chief of Rostrums. But the Jardinero, the radio drowned his voice. And now a peal of thunder drowned the radio. You pox boxes, you cox coxes, you killed that Indian. You tried to kill him and make it look like an accident, he roared. You're all in on it. The more of you come up and took his horse. Give me my papers back. Papers, cabron. You have no papers. Straightening himself, the consul saw in the chief of Rostrum's expression a hint of Monsieur Laurel, and he struck at it. Then he saw the chief of gardens again and struck that figure. Then the chief of municipality, the policeman he had refrained from striking this afternoon, he struck that figure too. The clock outside quickly chimed seven times. The cock flapped before his eyes, blinding him. The chief of Rostrum's took him by the coat. 
Someone else seized him from behind. In spite of his struggles, he was being dragged towards the door. The fairman who had turned up again helped shove him towards it, and Diosdado, who had vaulted ponderously over the bar, and a few fleas who kicked him viciously on the shins. The consul snatched a machete lying on the table near the entrance and brandished it wildly. Give me back those letters, he cried. Where was that bloody cock? He would chop off its head. He stumbled backward out onto the road. People taking tables laden with gaseosas in front of the storm stopped to watch. The beggars turned their head duly. The sentinel outside the barracks stood motionless. The consul didn't know what he was saying. Only the poor, only through God's, only the hope, only the people you wipe your feet on, the poor in spirit, old men carrying their fathers and philosophers weeping in the dust. America, perhaps, Don Quixote. He was still brandishing the sword. It was that saber, really, he thought, in Maria's room. If only you'd stop interfering, stop walking in your sleep, stop sleeping with my wife, only the beggars need a cursed. The machete fell with a rattle. The consul felt himself stumbling backwards until he fell over a tussock of grass. You stole that horse, he repeated. The chief of Rostums was looking down at him. Sanabria stood by, silent, grimly rubbing his cheek. Norte Americano, eh? said the chief. Inglés, you Jew. He narrowed his eyes. What the hell do you think you do around here? You pelado, eh? It's no good for your health. I shoot to twenty people. It was half threat, half confidential. We found out on the telephone. Is it right that you are a criminal? You are want to be a policeman? I make you policeman in Mexico. Consul rose to his feet, swaying. He caught sight of the horse, tethered to him. Only now he saw it more vividly, as uh, as a whole, electrified. The corded mouth, the shaved wooden pommel, wooden pommel behind which tape was hanging, the saddlebags, the mats under the belt, the sore and glossy shine on the hip bone, the number seven branch on the rump, the stud between the saddles, glittering like a topaz in the light from the cantina. He staggered towards it. I blow you wide open for your knees up, you drew Chingo, whispered the chief of Rostrums, grasping him by the collar, and the chief of gardens standing by, nodding gravely. The consul, shaking himself free, tore frantically at the horse's bridle. The chief of Rostrums stepped aside, stepped aside, hand on his holster. He drew his pistol. With his free hand, he waved away some tentative onlookers. I blow you wide open for your knees up, you cabron, he said, you pelado. No, I wouldn't do that, said the consul quietly, turning around. That's a Colt 17, isn't it? There was a lot of steel shavings. Chief of Rostrums pushed the consul back out of the light, took two steps forward and fired. Lightning flashed like an inchworm going to the sky and the consul, reeling above him for a moment, the shape of Popo, plumed with emerald snow and drenched with brilliance. The chief fired twice more, the shot spaced, deliberate. Thunderclaps crashed onto the mountains and then at hand. Released, the horse reared, tossing its head, it wheeled around and plunged neighing into the forest. At the first, the consul felt a queer relief. Now he realized he had been shot. He fell on one knee, then with a groan, flat on his face in the grass. Christ, he remarked, puzzled. This is a dingy way to die. A bell spoke out. Dolente, dolore. It was raining softly. Shapes hovered above him, holding his hand, perhaps still trying to pick his pockets, or to help, or merely curious. He could feel his life slivering out from him like a liver ebbing into the tenderness of the grass. He was alone. Where was everyone? Or had there been no one? And then a face shone out of the gloom, a mask of compassion. It was the old fiddler stub stooping over him. Companier, he began, then he vanished. Presently, the word Pilato began to fill his whole consciousness. That had been Hugh's word for the thief. Now someone had flung the insult at him. And it was as if that moment he had become the Pilato, the thief, yes, the pilfer of meaningless, muddled ideas out of which his rejection of life had grown, who had won his two or three little bowler hats, his disguises over these abstractions. Now the realest of them was all too close. But when someone had called him compañero too, which was better, much better, it made him happy. These thoughts drifting through his mind were accompanied by music he could hear only when he listened carefully. Mozart, wasn't it? The C Siciliana. Finale of the D minor quartet by Moses. No, it was something funeral of Gluck's probably, from Alcides. Yet there was a Bach-like quality to it. Bach, a clavichord, heard from far away, in England in the 17th century. England, the chords of a guitar too, half lost, mingled with the distant clamor of a waterfall, and what sounded like the cries of love. He was in Kashmir, he knew, lying in the meadows near running water among violets and trefoil, the Himalayas but beyond, which made it all the more remarkable he should suddenly be setting out with Hugh and Yvonne to climb Popo. Already they had drawn ahead. Can you pick Bourgogne Via, he heard Hugh say, and be careful, Yvonne replied. It's got spikes on it and you have to look 
at everything to make sure there's no spiders. We shoot a day of spiders in Mexico, another voice murmured. And with this, Hugh and Yvonne had gone. He suspected they had not only climbed Popo, but they were now far beyond it. Painfully, he trudged the slope of the foothills towards Amecamena, alone. With ventilated snow goggles, with alpenstock, with mittens and a wool cap pulled over his ears, with pockets full of dried prunes and raisins and nuts, with a jar of rice protruding from one coat pocket, and the Hotel Fausto's information from the other, he was other utterly weighed down. He could go no further. Exhausted, helpless, he sank to the ground. No one would help him even if they could. Now he was the one dying by the wayside where no good Samaritan would halt. Though it was perplexing there should be the sound of laughter in his ears, of voices. Ah, he was being rescued at last. He was in an ambulance shrieking through the jungle itself, racing uphill past Timberland toward the peak, and there was certainly one way to get there, while those friendly voices around him, Jacques and Vigiles, they would make allowances, would set Hugh and Yvonne's minds at rest about him. No se puede vivir sin amar, they would say, which would explain everything, and he repeated this aloud. How could he have thought so evil of the world when succor was at hand all the time, and now he had reached the summit. Ah, Vaughn, sweetheart, forgive me. Strong hands lifted him. Opening his eyes, he looked down, expecting to see below him the magnificent jungle, the heights, Pico de Orizabe, Malinche, Cofre de Perote, like those peaks of his life, conquered one after another, before this greatest ascent of all had been successfully, if conventionally, completed. But there was nothing there, no peaks, no climb, no life. Nor was this summit a summit exactly. It had no substance, no firm base. It was crumbling too, whatever it was. It was collapsing. While he was falling, falling into the volcano, he must have climbed it after all. But now there was this noise of lava in his ears, horribly. It was an eruption, yet no, it wasn't the volcano. The world itself was bursting, bursting into black spouts of villages, catapulting into space with himself falling through it all, through the inconceivable pandemonium of a million tanks, through the blazing of ten million burning bodies, falling into a forest, falling. Suddenly he screamed, and it was as though this scream was being tossed from one tree to another, as its echoes returned then, as though the trees themselves were crowding nearer, huddled together, closing over him, pitying. Someone threw a dead dog after him down the ravine. The end.